Hey guys, welcome back. Um, third video, chapter 24. Last one I said was going to be short, ended up at 18 minutes. <laughs> so let's shoot for a little shorter than 18 if I'm going to say it's short. That's my fault. We're going to jump into flatworms. This is a cool one. Uh, flatworms. Here's what we're going to see with this group of animals. Uh, the simplest protostomes. Uh, they have a flattened body. No duh. Flatworms makes sense, right? They have organ systems. So this is our first place where we're going to start to see things like uh, cells that work together in tissues that will just excrete waste or just move nutrition around or just create water pressure, something like that. But they have no body cavity, so they have no coelom or their acelomate. Okay, the, the coelom we said was that specific body cavity that came from that mesoderm. These guys don't have that yet, but they do have a lot more diversification in what they have in their body than what we've seen so far. When it comes to moving nutrition, it's pretty much going to be diffusion. Not to say there's not a network of almost like vessels that'll carry it around the flatworm, but when it comes to getting into all the cells, it's going to be pretty simple diffusion, which means that flatworms are going to have to stay pretty small as an animal. Uh, the vast majority of our flatworms are going to be hermaphrodites. Again, they're going to contain both genders, and some are free living, which is what we're going to talk about first, and then a few of them are parasites, and we'll talk about those last. Those are pretty cool. <clears throat> so, free-living flatworms have to move around, and they're going to be propelled by cilia, these little fibers that kind of move on the normally on the underside of the flatworm. And the most popular example of that is the planarian. Uh, it's, it's very popular because you can cut it in half, and it'll regrow both halves, and it doesn't matter how you cut it, it'll regrow. It's very, very cool. And it's a free-living flatworm. It's found in ponds. It's found in really moist habitats. Uh, so some can be terrestrial for a bit, but they have to be pretty, a pretty wet area where they're going to be terrestrial. Uh, they eat through a tube called a pharynx. Um, we have a pharynx in, in humans as well. It's where kind of our nose and our mouth kind of intersect prior to our throat. Um, but these guys have a pharynx, which is a tube that they can actually extend out of their body and they can kind of take little chunks of organic material off of twigs or dead bugs or whatever and kind of suck those little pieces of organic debris into their body with a pharynx. Um, the bad thing about it is it's the only body opening. And so if there's a food that's too big for you to digest, you must also excrete it through your pharynx. And so you kind of only have one hole for both of those jobs, which is kind of gross, but whatever. It doesn't seem to bother them. They have a gastrovascular cavity, kind of like the hydra does, you know, big tube in the middle of the body they can move their food through. They also have chemical receptors on their head, and those will detect light. They look like eyes, but they're not eyes, <laughs> but they do respond to photons. So maybe, you know, they can tell light and dark for sure. And I guess they can kind of smell. I don't know. I'll let you be the judge of that. Uh, they have a simple brain, which doesn't really count as a brain, but it's ganglia, and the ganglia is a big cluster of nerves, and so we call it cephalization, or the formation of a head. This is the first place we see that is with our planaria. And uh, they do have a higher solute concentration than the surrounding water, which would make their bodies, if you recall from GenBio, hypertonic compared to the environment. So water will be moving into their body all the time by osmosis, and they have to be pumping it out all the time or they would be growing basically you know all the time kind of being swollen up with water and so here's what your planarian looks like this is the gastrovascular cavity you see i told you it was kind of like vessels suck the food in through the mouth in through the pharynx and it goes through all these cavities and it can kind of diffuse food out that's how that works there's the eye spots that aren't really eyes but they kind of look like them Here's the nervous system. We have the big ganglia up here, and then these even nerve branchings, kind of like rungs of a ladder that are going to coordinate movements, which I'll show you on a video here in just a second. Uh, here we have the uh, solute regulating system of little tubes that are constantly taking water and pumping it back out into the environment. And then finally the reproductive system where we have ovaries and testes as well with oviducts and genital pores that will transport the egg and the sperm out into a more than likely aquatic environment. So I'm going to show you a video of how this thing swims around. There's a basketball game going on in the gym, so if you have to excuse the sound a little bit, i got to take my headphones out for you guys to see the video. So check out the planarian. 
structures like planaria that we first see bilateral symmetry and cephalization, the localization of the sense organs in the head region. A pair of ocelli, light-sensitive eye spots, are located toward the center of the head. Lobes extending from either side of the head contain chemosensory cells. Planaria feeds using the protrusible muscular pharynx. The chemosensory cells on the lobes are used to locate the food. Through rhythmic contraction of the muscular pharynx, planaria pumps the food into the gastrovascular cavity with a siphon-like action. Cancel. Planarian regeneration would be cool, but I told you I was going to keep this video short, so we're not going to do that. Okay. Let's move on to some not free living flatworms, some parasites. Uh, there's flukes and tapeworms. Uh, flukes and tapeworms are generally going to include multiple hosts to make it through one life cycle. Uh, they'll reproduce asexually in their first host, and then they'll develop into adults. They'll get into the second host, and they'll reproduce sexually in the second host, and then it starts over again. Uh, one example of this is schistosomiasis. Um, it's a human disease caused by a blood fluke, and it affects 200 million people, and that's most cases in Southeast Asia and Northern Africa, and I'll show you how they kind of get that disease in this slide. And so these are folks who are using their rivers. Um, it's, and I don't want to say drinking downstream from the herd, but that's basically what it is. The river is where you do your laundry you do your dishes, you get your drinking water, and it's that way for hundreds of miles upstream, maybe more, where other people are doing the same thing. And so for obvious reasons, it's bad when your bathroom is also the place where you do your dishes. And so here's how it works. You got a blood fluke in this guy right here, and it's got male and female, and it's in his intestine. They undergo sexual reproduction in the human host, and they have fertilized eggs that are going to drop out in the host feces. So this guy or gal needs to go to the bathroom, not in the river, but near the river, close enough to the river that with the next hard rainstorm, we wash all those zygotes down into the river. So goes to the bathroom in the river, this guy or gal does, and all of these brand new blood fluke babies are in the river, and they're going to go and develop into ciliated larvae and they're going to swim around just like we saw with jellyfish larvae. But they're not going to plant and grow into a polyp like a jellyfish. They're going to infect a snail. Then in the snail, they're going to reproduce asexually to make a different type of larva. Now this other larva swims off, and it gets into the blood and into the skin of this human who's back in the river, you know, downstream, maybe a different human who's a little ways downstream, and he's, you know, doing dishes or whatever in the river, getting drinking water, and he has little sores on his feet because he's walking around barefoot or he's walking around in sandals. That little guy crawls up into his blood, gets into his intestine, and it all starts over again. So it's pretty highly specialized because it depends on multiple hosts, and a lot of parasitic flatworms do that. So there's also tapeworms. Tapeworms are going to pretty much just exclusively live in the vertebrate gut, to our understanding. Cows, sheep, us, that kind of stuff. They have a head structure that has these hooks and suckers on it that can actually bite onto the gut wall in, our, in like our small intestine or a small intestine of a, you know, of a cow, a cow or whatever, and they'll stay in there. And they don't have a gastrovascular cavity because they don't do their own digesting. The sheep and the cow and the person do the digesting, and the tapeworm takes the nutrition from what we've already digested, and they absorb that right across their body wall, and then they can grow these long sections called proglottids. The thing that actually grabs onto the, the host is called a scolex, and the little body rings that they grow out are called the proglottids. And the proglottids can break off, travel out into the feces, and continue the life cycle somewhere else. Humans are generally the final host, and we'll show you how this kind of works. So, uh, the little larva, we got the, the tapeworms in the human stomach, small intestine. 
tapeworm bites on to you in your small intestine with his scolex and the nasty little hooks. And he grows all these proglottids. And each one of these proglottids can have sperm and egg in them and undergo sexual reproduction. So you can imagine the number of larvae these things can make are insane. And so they make the larva. The human goes to the bathroom out in the field and poops out a bunch of larvae of these brand new little tapeworms. Moo cow or sheep is grazing in the same grass that the human pooped in and eats the larva. Now the larva gets into the bloodstream of moo cow and the meat is infested with a tapeworm. And if the human eats the medium rare or rare moo cow, we start the process over again. So there's obviously many links in this where this little chain could be broken and not be infecting people, but it still is worldwide. Uh, for example, grazing where you're pooping. Don't do that. That's a bad thing. We could break that chain right there. Um, maybe make that beef steak well done. We could break the chain right there. But all over the place, that chain's not being broken. So obviously, it's not that easy. Or a lot of countries aren't able to do that, I guess. So there's your steps. We kind of explained them. Doesn't sound like much fun, but that's the end of the section. So hopefully that video was a little bit shorter. That's flatworms. Thanks for your time.